All right. Yes. Are you ready? <laughs> yes. I would like to welcome you all um, to the PhD defense of master um, uh, of master in financial economics, Emre Sari. Um, before we begin, I would like to remind everybody that this trial lecture and the defense will be recorded uh, so that uh, the audience that is not in the auditorium can follow the events. My name is Andrea Mandai and I'm a professor in economics here at the School of Business and Economics at Campus Tromsø, UIT. The opponents today are uh, Professor Thorpe Gilt Hansen, Department of Public Health, University of Southern Denmark. She's the first opponent, and she will be joining us digitally. And then we have Professor Jonas uh, Minet Kinge, Department of Health Economics and Health Management, uh, UIO, who's the second opponent, who is with us here uh, today. In the first part of the defense, Emre Sari will present his trial lecture on a given topic that was given to him by the evaluation committee uh, 10 working days ago. After the lecture, the committee will meet shortly and uh, evaluate the lecture. And then we will meet again at 12.15 here uh, to listen to Emre Sari's PhD defense. We ask the audience to be seated before, uh, or that you come back here a few minutes before we start and so that you're seated when the committee and the candidate will enter the room. But before we get to the defense, it is my great pleasure uh, to give the floor to Emre Sari for the presentation of his trial lecture, and that, which is titled Instrumental Variables in Economics, Current Standards for Validity and Common, pit, pit, sorry, <laughs> common Pitfalls. Um, thank you so much, and, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Oh. Oop. Dear Chair, esteemed committee members, respected colleagues, beloved family and friends, a warm morning to each one of you and thank you for being here. I am Emre Sade and it's my honor to be here today to present trial lecture as part of my PhD defense. The topic of today's lecture is instrumental variables in economics, current standards for validity and common pitfalls. Broadly, I will introduce the complexities of instrumental variables and current standards that ensure their validity and present common pitfalls researchers often encounter. As we delve into econometrics, it's vital to highlight its uniqueness. Angris and Pinschke point out two distinctions between econometrics and statistics. First, econometrics confi confidently tackles causality challenging the conventional hesitance of statisticians. Secondly, econometrics boosts special tools with the instrumental variables method being paramount. Today, we will explore how IV offers insight into complex systems and beyond. Before we explore instrumental variables, let's first lay the foundation with an introduction to simple linear regression and ordinary least squares estimation. A simple linear regression model is a statistical model used to model the linear relationship between one dependent variable and one independent variable. With this model, we deal with two key variables, represented by y and x. y represents our dependent variable, the outcome or variable we are trying to predict or explain. x is our explanatory variable, the predictor or the variable we use to make predictions. Beta 0 is the y-intercept and beta 1 is the slope of the regression line. Lastly, epsilon denotes the error term. The difference between observed value and the value predicted by our models. Overall, these variables signify a certain population and we are interested in explaining y in terms of x or in studying how, varies, how y varies with the changes in x. 
We covered the key elements. Now let's see the, their role in achieving the best fitting, best fit using OLS. OLS works by finding the regression line that minimizes the sum of squared differences between the actual data points and predicted values on the line. In each chart, we vertical lines illustrate these differences for each point, showing how OLS seeks to make these as small as possible. Exogeneity versus endogeneity. There are two critical distinctions for the X variable. Either X is exogenous or endogenous. When we say a predictor X is exogenous, we mean that it doesn't have any correlation with Y equations, error term, epsilon. Think of it as the ideal scenario where the predictor stands alone, alone without any inference from our error term. Endogenous, however, things get complicated when X does correlate with epsilon. In this case, we label X as endogenous. This means our estimated coefficient for X won't be true to the real effect. It becomes both biased and inconsistent. Endogeneity. With this foundation, it is crucial to address one of the most prominent challenges in econometrics. This concept where an explanatory variable is correlated with the error term, can lead to misleading results and incorrect policy implications. As Bastardos et al. noted in 2023, scholars often assert causal claims without the proper data or estimation strategies to support them. Let's delve into deeper this. In this figure, I visualize the endogeneity in general According to related figures in Hill et al. study, the error term epsilon emerges because factors that influence y script i are not included in the regression function. When the predictor x correlates with the error term, this cause causes bias in the estimate of beta. This bias can be upward or downward depending on the unmodeled factors that correlate with x and predict y. Endogeneity often arises due to omitted variable bias, omitted variables, simultaneity, measurement errors, and selection. Let's assume that the omitted variable Q affects Y. So when Q is not modeled, it's contained within the error term. When Q is also correlated with X, then X is correlated with the error term. In the literature, some similar terms refer to omitted variables, such as omitted variable bias, missing variable, and unmeasured variable problem. Let me give you a real-world example. In Levi Meltzer's research to graphs endogeneity, they consider the link between health insurance and health outcomes. It's not just about access to care, unobserved elements like income complicate matters. However, it's not that simple. Imagine, there are other unobserved factors, such as income. Higher income individuals might not only afford better health insurance, but also lead healthier lifestyles, have better diets, or have access to better living conditions. So, neglecting factors like income in such analysis can bias the results due to the correlation with predictor. This is the crux of omitted variable bias. The second reason for endogeneity is simultaneity. In this figure, I present the omitted uh, path from y to x. The estimate of how x affects y is biased if y also affects x. Some similar terms refer to simultaneity, such as reverse causality and joint determination. In the study by Daniel Bashka et al., the relationship between grandparental childcare and the health and well-being of grandparents in Europe was examined. The initial assumption might be that childcare involvement leads to better health outcomes for grandparents due to increased activities. However, the possibility of reverse causation is also present as healthier grandparents may be more likely to provide childcare. This creates Simultaneity bias. Where the direction of cause and effect is unclear. This study highlighted that while health improvements were noted, 
they were more pronounced between different individuals rather than within the same individual over time. Leading to challenges in isolating the effect of childcare on health due to this two-way relationship. The third cause of endogeneity is measurement error. Bias is created if any error in measuring X resulting in X tilde, rather than X is correlated with Y. Some similar terms refer to measurement error, such as errors in variables and observational error. Let's consider a real-world example from Edwards et al. study on the relationship between body and mass index and income. The study acknowledged potential measurement errors in self-reported weight and height. Particularly heavier individuals often underreport their weights. This can have an impact on the study outcomes. In response to these errors, the researchers applied specific correction method, and after this adjustment, their results remained consistent. A key aspect of their approach was using individual's genotype, which is randomly assigned from parental genes at conception, as an instrumental variable. Endogeneity from selection occurs when a sample isn't random, leading to a biased Y star due to both observed variables X and unobserved factors W. This non-random name means X is also correlated with the error term epsilon, which can skew research outcomes. The concept of selection of treatment refers to scenarios where an external factor denoted as W influenced the assignment of, of assignment or intensity of primary variable X. This non-random assignment term selection and presented by S can affect the outcome Y. If W is related to Y, it becomes part of the error term, leading to correlation between X and Epsilon, which introduced bias into the analysis. Let me give you one more real-world example from Essel Geise et al. study on financial resilience and mental health in South Africa. Think of financial resilience as a special training program to help individuals manage their finances better. Now, instead of offering this program to everyone, it's given to the individuals who have a certain financial background or specific spending habits. Let's call this W. The decision of who gets into this financial resilience program is not random, but is based on their financial background. This chosen method is what we term as selection, symbolized by S. Now, if the financial background has any link to their mental health, it might get mixed up in the unknown factors, the error term. In their research, they have tackled this by employing instrumental variable estimation, ensuring that they compare individuals with similar backgrounds and try to eliminate this bias. It's known that many studies broadly address endogeneity without pinpointing its specific causes. But, but why does it matter? Because each cause requires a unique solution. And sometimes, multi multiple causes can influence one study. It's essential to preci precisely identify and address this right cause, ensuring our research is both accurate and effective. Addressing endogeneity is central to econometric research, and there is a suite of techniques to manage this. As presented in this table, the, the pivotal role of instrumental variable is hard to miss. From the two-step method and dynamic panel techniques to the Hackman models, which I have used in my PhD, these variables are essential in countering biases. So one of the beauties of instrumental variables lies in their adaptability to various estimation techniques. Now we will zoom in on the instrumental variables. The core concept here is the instrumental variable, a technique in econometrics for achieving reliable estimates when our explanatory variables and error term are intervened. 
which violates the OLS requirement for exogenous variables. IVs are the solution when an unobserved third variable confuses the effect of one variable on another. They are essential in overcoming endogeneity, which I have detailed earlier. As functionality, an IV acts much like a stand-in or a proxy. It helps present the problematic predictor without bringing along the baggage of endogeneity. By using IVs, we can ensure that the estimates we get are not only consistent, but also unbiased. To be more specific, let's identify the problem. I want to briefly introduce two stage list curves, the second most common approach in empirical economic, economics after OLS regression. Consider a scenario where the variable we are analyzing X has underlying factors affecting it might disorder or results due to endogeneity. To navigate this problem, we employ an instrument, instrumental variable. Now it's time to operationalize the IV with the two-stage two stage least scarce est approach. 2SLS works in two main stages. In the first stage, which is also called reduced form equation, we regress our problematic variable X on our chosen instrument Z. This regression yields a clean prediction of X, which we'll label as, as X hat. Moving to the second stage, we use X hat to predict our target variable, Y. The beauty of 2SLS is that the coefficient we derive, alpha 1, provides an undistorted causal effect, on, causal effect of X on Y. The IV approach is used in both cross-sectional and time series contexts. But there are some fundamental differences in how IVs are implemented and interpreted across these data structures and their combined version, the panel data. In cross-sectional an analysis, instruments must be variables that are correlated with the endogenous explanatory variables, but uncorrelated with the error term of the regression. When multiple instruments are available for single endogenous variable, our identification tests, such as sargon hansen test, can be applied to assess the validity of instruments. It must be assumed that the instruments are not affected by the individual specific effects that cause the endogeneity of the explanatory variables. Leban Baum et al. study is a good example for example of the cross-sectional data context. They use a family history of mental health issues as the instrument to assess the impact of mental health on social capital based on data from 2012 and 2002 Canadian Community Health Survey. And they employ the instrumental variable method and run Sargon's over-identifying test given the presence of multiple instruments. In time series, lags of the dependent variable or exogenous variables are often used as instruments. The assumption here is that the past values influence current values but are not affected by the current shocks or errors, thus satisfying the exogeneity requirement. In the presence of non-stationary time series data that are co-integrated, an error correction model can be used. Here, the short-term dynamics can be treated with IV to handle endogeneity while also accounting for the long-term equilibrium relationship. Time series models need to be content with the responsibility of serial correlation in the errors, which can affect the validity of the instrument. This means that additional care must be taken to ensure the instruments are not themselves serially, serially correlated with the error term. When dealing with the panel data that includes a time series component, additional methods such as Arellano bond estimator or the system generalized method of moments can be used to address endogeneity. These methods often involve 
using lag levels as instruments for differences, different equations, and vice versa. As an example, Sharma's study revisits the health growth correlation using dynamic panel data from 17 advanced economics from 1870 to 2013. Applying the panel generalized method of moments to address endogeneity and reverse causality. From a relevance point of view, the instrument must be strongly correlated with the endogenous regressors in both cross-sectional and time series data contexts. As the validity of the instrument, it must not be correlated with the error term to satisfy instrument's exogeneity criteria. We can use the test for endogeneity, such as the durbin wu hosman test, and for the strength of instruments, like the Stock yoga test. The Walt test, crack donald Walt test are applicable in both settings. The two-stage least curve is a common estimation technique used in both cross-sectional and time-series IV analysis. The implementation of IV test techniques do varies between cross-sectional and time-series data due to differences in data structure. The potential for autocorrelation and the nature of available instruments. It's important for econometricians to be mindful of these differences and to choose appropriate method and test for their specific application. Lag variables may serve as an instrument if not correlated with individual effect. Instruments in panel data must still satisfy the relevance and exogeneity conditions. However, there is an added complexity due to panel structure. For instance, lag variables might be used as instruments, but one must ensure they are not correlated with individual specific effects. The Hansen J test checks instrument validity while the system GMM and Arellano bond estimators help control for regressors endogeneity. Finally, adjust standard errors for autocorrelation and heterocadasticity using cluster robust methods. Using panel data from 45 civil nursing homes from 2006 to 2010, Georgia et al. examined the cost-quality relationship, focusing on clinical indicators from the minimum data set, addressing omitted variables and simultaneity biases. They employ IV approaches using the efficient GMM combined with the fixed effects model. They also employed the Hosman test for testing the endogeneity of IV and Hansen J test for over, over identification. I want to touch upon the historical landscape of instrumental variables in economics and present how their validity has been developed over time. And then I will continue with current validity standards. Instrumental variables were pioneered in the 2020s by Philip Wright to tackle causality in economic modeling. Further, refined and named by Reyer Sol from University of Oslo in the 1940s. They have since become critical in econometrics for handling omitted variable biases and other issues in causal inference. As we move into the 1950s and 1970s, the emphasizes shifted to refining their methodological foundations and addressing the challenges posed by traditional methods. In the 80s and 90s, saw key developments in econometrics with a focus on reconciling differences between experimental methods and traditional methods, using natural experiments for data and improving instrument, instrumental variable methods through late to enhance their validity. Finally, we arrived at the modern standard set in 2000s, such as standards for further refined and addressed instruments exogeneity. 
In 2021, the Nobel Prize in Economics honored the laureates for their methodological advancements in understanding causal relationships. It was a testament to the importance of this topic. Now, what are the IV assumptions? Now, I will present conditions for instrumental ver uh, instrument validity as outlined by Angris and Pinchke in 2009 and Bastardots et al. in 2023. Just like OLS regression, IV estimates require certain unbiasedness assumptions. These are linearity in parameters, random sampling, and no perfect multicollinearity. Moving on, there are three cardinal conditions for an instrument to be considered valid. These conditions are relevance, as if randomness or exogeneity, and exclusion restriction. I will explain them in upcoming slide. Being by defining the relevance condition, it's essential that our chosen instrument Z has a significant correlation with our endogenous, endogenous predictor X. Why is this important? If Z is a strong predictor of X, it allows us to accurately estimate the effect of X on Y through instrumental variable estimation. But if the instrument is weak, it can drastically skew our results, providing biased and inconsistent estimates, regardless of other conditions being met. Let's talk numbers. Your instrument strength is measured using an F statistic. Traditionally, an F statistic above 10 was considered strong. When you are going through regression results, focus on the F statistic for your instrument Z. A common pitfall? Some scholars argue for relevance just by pointing out Z and X are correlated. This is a misconception. The true measure of relevance is the F statistic for the excluded instruments. Exogeneity or as if randomness. Is that, in a simpler terms, our chosen instrument shouldn't be influenced by other unobserved or omitted variables. It's like ensuring our instrument captures the relationship we are interested in. There are different ways as an instrument can be random. It might be deliberately set by a researcher, such as experimentally randomized instrumental variables result from an un unforeseen events, such as wars, or arise from natural occurrences, such as events like gender composition at the first two children or damages from natural disasters. Testing the as if randomness of an instrument is dull because we can't see all variables. Researchers must defend their choice with solid reasoning and evidence showing the instrument is consistently random across what we can observe. The choice hinges on a strong theoretical argument, as unseen factors may remain unbalanced. The last condition for instrument validity is exclusion restriction. The exclusion restriction fundamentally means that our chosen instrument should affect our dependent variable only through the instrumented predictor. A common pitfall is that many researchers tend to blend the as-if random condition with exclusion restriction. It's essential that we treat them as a distinct criteria. To give you an example, the instrument might correlate with the outcome, but the correlation is acceptable only if it is due to the instrument's effect on the endogenous predictor and not because of the direct link between instrument and outcome. The exclusion restriction for instrumental variables states that the instrument influences the dependent variables only through the independent variable of interest. While empirical tests like Hansen-Sargon can detect unwanted correlations, they are still not foolproof. The key is to ensure your instrument is theoretically sound and logically justified. All right, everyone. 
<laughs> having, the, having discussed the foundational conditions for the validity of instrumental variables, let's now outline the procedural guidance on how you might approach this in practice. First, remember to validate the as-if randomness of your instrument, Z. This isn't just about number crunching. It's about justifying the solid theoretical reasoning. If your answer is no, do not use Z as an instrument. But if your answer is yes, to ensure the instrument validity, check if Z is random and correlated with X. Always report first stage F statistic. And if your answer is that Z is not correlated with X, don't use Z as an instrument. But if your answer is yes, and lastly, be sure that Z influences Y only through X, this can be a bit tricky. While theoretical reasoning is crucial, remember to employ necessary empirical tests. So if your answer is no for this, Again, do not use Z as an instrument. But if your answer is yes, still, it's not enough. <laughs> Assuming Z is random, confirm with theory. A key takeaway from this flowchart, in a sense, this guidance aims to streamline your process, reducing pitfalls and ensuring a robust instrumental variable analysis. After all the information and examples about instrumental variable estimation, I want to share a real-world application from Valentina Tone, which I respect a lot to her with the study. Her paper investigates the impact of unplanned cesarean deliveries on mother's mental health in the first nine months post-delivery. Tone accounts for unobserved heterogeneity between mothers by using the baby's position in the womb at delivery as an exogenous variation, while also controlling for hospital factors. Without going into other details in the paper, I will stick to the instrumental variable approach. In this study, Tone employs instrumental variable approach addressing potential biases stemming from unobserved mother-specific characteristics. Central to this, the IV of the study indicates whether a baby is in a branch position, feet or shoulders first, at birth. The first regression stage outlined the end, emphasizing the necessity of three conditions for the approach validity, exclusion restriction, as if randomness, and relevance. To test the exclusion restriction condition, Tone provides evidence using a regression model highlighting that only the mother's BMI significantly predicts the branch position of the baby, validating the instrument's exogeneity. Tone also provides a balance test comparing the covariates of women based on the branch position of their babies, revealing that most variables show no significant difference between the groups while emphasizing the association of age, income, and education with branch position. Tone here highlights the importance of the instrumental variables needs to different in terms of unobservable characteristics. So to speak, she is testing for the as-if randomness by using mother's smoking behavior as a proxy and analyzing the residuals from a predictive model. Here we see an example for the instrument's relevance. So, Tone reports F statistics for the excluded instruments of the first stage regression. In addition to that, Tone also reports a weak identification test for the significance of the excluded instrument. And an endogeneity test to verify the validity of IV and report F statistics of suggested that the instrument is not weak. Furthermore, the endogeneity test with a significant p-value indicates that the instrument is indeed exogenous. Finally, 
In Tonet's robustness examination, she examines the model specification by utilizing both bivariate probit and two-stage residual inclusion methodologies. The later 2SRI incorporates residuals from the first stage to address endogeneity in the second stage, a strategy also called control function approach. Notably, she employs these techniques as a test to ascertain the sensitivity of outcomes based on the chosen empirical strategy. This comparison reveals visible differences between 2SLS and 2SRI results. Here, a pivotal takeaway is Tonei's transparent communication about her selected instrumental variable methodology and inherent complexities it presents. Now, the common pitfalls. <sighs> Let's focus on instrumental variables and their common pitfalls. As we navigated the lecture, you have seen recurring challenges. These aren't just passing concerns. They are core hurdles in our analysis. Think of it as choosing a foundation when building a structure. The instrument in our analysis acts as, the f acts, acts as this foundation and the weak choice can lead to skewed results. A significant concern is when our chosen instrument correlates with our overlooked variables akin to an unseen flow in our foundation. Such issues can, at times, introduce even bigger biases than basic OLS method. As we move forward, it is essential to critically assess our instrument choices. Weak instruments in IV estimation are problematic. When they poorly correlate with endogenous regressors, it can distort results, this, main, this manifests in biases similar to OLS estimates, especially in small samples, leading to large standard errors and potentially misleading conclusions. Brown and Murphy, Murphy applied the LIML estimator in their empirical investigation to deal with such weak instrument issues. In their study, Ren et al. 2020 utilized conditional likelihood ratio tests to verify the relevance of their chosen instruments. Diverging from the empirical domain, Imai et al. in 2022 20, introduced a broader perspective with their paper title a general approach to causal mediation analysis, shedding light on the non-parametric IV approach, offering a more theoretical insight into defining variable relationships. The integration of machine learning in this domain is also noteworthy. A Golin 2022 study showcased its potential in instrument selection using the least absolute shrinkage and selection operator method. Finally, in an empirical explora exploration, Chen studied the relationship between health risk perception and beetle achieving using a Bayesian two-stage approach to account for endogeneity. Angris and Kruger warn against uncritical use of probit and logit in IV first stages due to risk to second stage estimate consistency and the complexities of nonlinear models. Navigating econometric analysis requires careful selection of instruments to ensure their validity and the importance of being vigilant about potential biases to main maintain the integrity of the results. And conclusion. Instrumental variable estimation, like other statistical tools, has its complications. If not used correctly, it can lead to more harm than good. It is essential to ensure the condition for a, validity, a valid instrument are met. Otherwise, our estimates can be misleading and potentially even worse than simpler methods like OLS. 
While it is often impossible to eliminate it entirely, using IV correctly can significantly improve the rigor of our causal identifications. The evolution of the IV estimation emphasizing and changing its robustness, adaptability, and clarity. The summary in this trial lecture reaffirms best practices and points towards promising areas of future research on IV. Before ending this lecture, I want to conclude with a quote from Angris and Kruger. Here, the challenges are not primarily technical in the essence of requiring new theorems or estimators. Rather, progress comes from detailed institutional knowledge and the careful investigation and quantification of the forces at work in a particular setting. Reference and further readings. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>